Hi everyone. Um, so Allah, I'll start. Um, so moving from Macedonia to Kosovo is not, not very far. It's actually a, a short drive. It's about on a, on a good day about three hours. So but we it's can great. Do it in, we can do it in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so where is the? Do you want the clicker? Yeah. Let me... Okay. In the last month of the Kosovo War in 1999, around 70,000 Kosovo Serbs had to flee Kosovo, leaving most possessions behind. What, while some had already seen the writing on the wall and bought property in Serbia or made arrangements facilitating their move, most Kosovo Serbs I interv and interviewed had not anticipated the sudden retreat of the Yugoslav army and Serbian police and the paramilitary uh, from Kosovo. The retreat led to an escalation of violence against Kosovo Serbs by the majority Kosovo Albanian population, who had endured much hardship under the Serbian regime and suffered heavy losses during the conflict. Their security compromised, without the protection of their army and police, Kosovo Serbs less left en masse and in extremis. About half of the total available housing stock in Kosovo, Kosovo uh, has been destroyed or made uninhabitable, um, uninhabitable sorry, during the armed conflict. As Kosovo Albanians started returning to Kosovo under the protection of the K4, Kosovo Serbian houses, shops, barns were looted and many were set on fire. Many Kosovo Serbian um, many Kosovo Albanian returnees, sorry, made, ho made homeless by the conflict, took possession of abandoned Kosovo Serbian properties. Um, the Kosovo Liberation Army, led by Akim Tachi, the now president of Kosovo, uh, also started allocating Kosovo, Ser Kosovo Serbian houses and apartments to its members and affiliates and forces transactions were widespread. It was also common for Kosovo Albanian returnees uh, to find their own property already occupied by another Albanian family, forcing them to seek alternative shelter. Within the architecture of post-conflict reconstruction, re-establishing property rights was seen as a key means to alleviate the humanitarian emergency of mass displacement. It was also seen as a central precondition to kick-starting economic development um, and ensuring Kosovo's future as a multi-ethnic, democratic and EU-compatible state. So moving away from uh, contentious politics of ethnicity, the UN and later the EU framed the rationale of property restitution in the language of development economics. According to such view, legalizing property rights um, leads to economic development as people would be able to use their property as collateral to borrow money for investment, as well as avoid a necessary conflict through rights legalization. Under this neoliberal logic of intervention in the name of un the universal property rights, uh, sorry, universal human rights to private property, preventing the entire ethnic homogenization of the territory, translated into giving a strong emphasis on minority rights, perhaps counterintuitively in terms of transitional justice. Kosovo Serbs, the villains in the international narrative, were to be sent back home, meaning Kosovo. Um, Serbian displaced persons were to benefit first and foremost from the property restitution scheme. Seven years after the end of the war in 2006, the United Nations uh, Interim Administration in Kosovo, UNMIC, put in place the Kosovo Property Agency, a mass claims mechanism mandated to adjudicate, to adjudicate sorry, war-related mm -hmm. private property claims, uh, including resident, residential, uh, but also commercial and agricultural property. Because of the way the mandate was framed, privileging people displaced towards the end of the conflict and those not able to repossess their properties afterward, more than 90% of KP claims were lodged by displaced Kosovo Serbs. At the end of its mandate in 2016, the agency had processed a total of 42,749 claims. So we saw, as we saw yesterday, 
in a Wittgensteinian sense, claiming and petitioning have a sort of family resemblance, uh, in that both are demanding recognition and some kind of stuff from a po powerful authority. Claiming like some kind of petitioning congeals sociality while at the same time providing a space for the recognition of injury. In this paper, I emphasize the emotional investment in property claims as a way of validating, getting recognition for, and being able to work through the loss of property, which stands in for home, uh, the Dalvinas, or ancestral land, and in a, sense or, in a sense also for self. So in a fashion similar to petitioning at the ECHR, for example, this claiming process adjudicate, adjudicated in a way entire biographies and documents took on a life of their own uh, during but also after the end of the legal process and even if the outcome of the process was not a favorable one. My focus is on the kind of work property documents and documents exchanged between parties and the agency did for claimants. So documents as artifact of translation, as boundary objects, as translation devices, at the interface between claimant's worldview and the agencies. Boundary objects mediated communication and cooperation by bridging perceptual and practical differences. Without property and documents necessarily carrying the same meanings for all actors, and especially not for the KPA uh, and its parties. Um, in this paper, I analyze the ways in which the process of claiming impacted claimants' relationship to their lost property. The argument I make is that property documents became melancholic objects, uh, signifying property loss. The closest things people have to remember their former lives, their lost homes. So the substance of loss shifted from other objects, such as photographs, pieces of furniture and ruins, onto property documents, uh, loss materialized in the form of these documents. So a particularity of the mass claims restitution process is that it was entirely based on document. In 2006 and 7, prospective claimants were given a window of nine months during which they could approach the agency and submit oral and documentary evidence. Their oral statements were directly transcribed by KP officers in the newly created files. For most claimants, the claim intake interview was the only personal contact they had with the KPA before the delivery of decisions, and the only time they got to explain their stories in their own words. So claimants sometimes sent letters later to the KPA and received very kind of, you know, official non sequitur answers um, that um, didn't actually help them understand how the process worked. And uh, most of them had no idea, uh, absolutely no idea, of how the KP actually processed their claims. Uh, they would receive one decision about uh, plot A and having to wait three years later for a decision about plot B, which was to them the same claim, but to the agency to very different claims because of legal, uh, the le legal perspective on, on these properties. So mass claims processing, however, so as I said, meant that claimants' narratives were stripped of their complexity and nuance and transformed into legal constructs from the start. This allowed the KPA to turn issues of laws, belonging, kinship, injustices, in particular legal technical ways, that were often completely remo removed from the social rea reality of applicants. And again, I'm referring in my longer paper to marie Benedict your work uh, as well, uh, thinking about this kind of very different types of realities, the legal and the social. As a feature of discourse and action, the process of legal translation transforms the way in which people understand themselves and their social bonds through the reframing of existing problems into the terms required for them to be dealt, legally, dealt with legally, translated, translating grievances in legal terms by focusing solely on documents created a certain type of document subject, not just documented subject or paper truth, but the crystallization of personhood in the form and content, content of documents much more easily manageable in legalistic terms than individ individuals and their messy stories. 
A difference between claiming and petitioning is that the onus is not on claimants to make the work on tr of translation alone. In fact, they don't do much in terms of translation in the legal process. Claimants subjectify themselves to the process. They're not at its origin. Um, and actually, the KPA started with organizing, um, you know, legal offices to uh, drive to uh, camps, refugee camps, drive to Roma encampment, to um, faraway uh, villages, uh, to get people to, you know, sign up as claimants. So, in a way, the agency had as much to lose as claimants for not climbing, or maybe much more, actually, than claimants themselves. Um, so, claiming creates spaces for subterfuge, contestation, and rights-based expression of citizenship as a social form, while also generating social obligations on both sides, as I said. For this research, I conducted 14 months of ethnographic fieldwork between 2012 and 13. most of it uh, while serving as a research intern at the KPA. Um, I worked with its commissioners the, at the KPCC, so the Kosovo Property Claims Commission. I also worked uh, with uh, Supreme Court judges uh, in charge of KPA appeals cases. I did um, legal um, and documentary analysis, media and social media analysis, archival work, and interviews with claimants and respondents in Kosovo and Serbia. So after nine months of institutional ethnography of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., five days a week, analyzing documents exchanged and the internal processing of files, I wanted to meet with the fleshy people behind the files. So I suspected the that the Swiss Development Corporation, one of KPA's main funders, might be interested in funding a research project that would give voice to claimants and respondents beyond claim files by looking at the role and practical implications of the KPA property restitution pro process for its beneficiaries. In the context of growing donor fatigue, it was a good way for the Swiss corporation to make the work of the KPA more empirically tangible back in Switzerland. I contacted the head of the mission with a project proposal and was soon a recipient of a small project grant. Um, so, which is kind of in a way uh, interesting because I, I was not in, in posi a position as an academic researcher to do, to do that research, so I had to transform myself in, into a kind of a development consultant to be able to do the ethnography I wanted to do. Um, and so I was claiming myself certain, a certain kind of recognition and also a way to give back to the people I was working with. And so The Fates Behind the Numbers, the book that came out of this research consultancy, is a compilation of some of the 35 interviews I conducted. And I, um, thanks to that money, I worked with two translators and a professional photographer. And we even got to hire our own driver. So this is our little team uh, in Kosovo. <laughs> so um, again, my position positionality in this research is very interesting because I was so I was part of the KPA um, as uh, I had a contract with them, um, and so I was able to use their data to find out who these claimants were. Um, and so I used uh, the KPA itself. I asked. Um, uh, the KPA IT unit to randomly select cases from the 2011 session to make sure that I wasn't actually breaching, breaching confidentiality rules by asking questions to people who are still in the process of receiving uh, decisions. Um, and I also get, got the help from uh, the ladies from the call centre who uh, called claimants on my behalf and were able to explain. So we had discussions about what the project was, which was very interesting. Like also the reactions I got from KPA staff about this, th what I wanted to do. Um, and so I used the KPA, which gave me a certain, as I said, positioning. And I, I take this very seriously in the, t in the sense that my kind of anthropological analysis that I'm going to give about the interviews, the narrative that I received is, I mean, do keep in mind that I know that 
uh, claimants kind of saw me somehow as someone loosely attached to the institution uh, that was processing or that had processed their claims. So uh, we got to meet these claimants uh, in the offices of the KPA in Serbia um, under uh, the patronage of the UNHCR because um, Serbia doesn't recognize Kosovo institutions. Um, and uh, what we did is that uh, we invited claimants to drive them back home or their, not home, but their places of residence. And we spent time there uh, also thinking about what the difference was between where they lived now and, and their past. And uh, it was also a way for them to show us um, artifacts of loss. Um, and um, a few times um, we also organized to visit claimed properties with claimants. And um, so that was also very, very emotional uh, as well. So, uh, this is KP decisions. Um, the bigger picture here is my interest in understanding why property restitution operated the way it did without apparent impact. So I found KPA lawyers, the judges of the Supreme Court and parties all agreed on one thing, is that the KPA um, only processed documents to adjudicate claims and issue decisions. Uh, it didn't create new rights, it just reasserted existing ones. It managed paper to produce more paper. KPA lawyers knew of no changes to the cadastral records that were done on the basis of the institution's decisions. Evictions of illegal occupants, one of KPA's sole tangible implementation mechanism, had only short-term effects because the national judiciary did not enforce the, the prohibition of illegal occupation. Illegal third party constructions that should have been destroyed by the institution were left untouched, although a constitutional court judgment had ordered the KPA to go through with the destruction. More strikingly still, the number of Kosovo Serbian displaced persons returning to Kosovo was, dis uh, was uh, decre uh, yeah, decreasing each year. So, and while return was never a KPA prerogative per se, the return of displaced persons had been the origin and political impetus for its setting up. So why did claimants care about their KPA cases? And how did their care, this care translate in their everyday? Why, despite the dehumanization they must have felt when submitting their claims and the complete puzzlement as to how the KPA worked or what it was actually going to be able to achieve? So why people seem to accord such a great regard towards KPA documents? Why didn't claimants give up? I mean, some of them did, but not so many. So sometimes waiting 10 years for a decision, a piece of paper with which there wasn't much they could do. In our interviews, I would ask claimants to start at the beginning. Invariably, the beginning for them meant a mythical idealized past in their former homes in Kosovo. A past that belonged to a temporality of remembering, bound to iterative life cycles that were broken by uprooting. The recounting of a mythicized past was followed by a story of existential loss of everything that used to exist. Social relations, a sense of belonging, the workplace, kinship and blood ties, and material objects such as the house, the well, the rakia maker, Claimants starkly compared their former lives, the freedom they remember experiencing when working their land together, ce celebrating key events with their Kosovo Albanian friends, visiting their ancestors' graves, living the good life with their life. So they compared this with their lives after it all happen happened, surviving sometimes in subhuman conditions in Serba Serbia. Strikingly, the comparison often revolved around the difference between living at home, the social relations that homeliness created around the physical place of the house, its material and things, the land cemetery as homeland, the physical roots of a collective and idealized identity, and the, and the unhomely, the unfamiliar, the uncanny, being housed somewhere that's not your, your own, in prefabricated accommodation, surrounded by accumulated stuff. So this is the, the quotes are all from interviews, as strangers in their own country. 
Miodrag Milic, a Kosovo Serb in his 20s living with his parents in welfare housing due to his physical handicap, talked about his family's socio-economic situations uh, following their uprooting. Here in Blatze, Serbia, we are a second class. They harass us and say, here come the shiptas, there go the shiptas. I would be better to be called, it would be better to, be, to call us Kosovars, which is the Albanian uh, version, than to call us out like that. Here we have nothing. This flat is also someone else's. We have no chances of ever owning it. They just gave it to us temporarily. You never know when they can kick you out. Our property in Kosovo was destroyed. We're homeless. Homelessness was articulated in many such narratives in terms of property loss. Property loss in Miodrags and other informants' narratives was expressed through stories of home, of destructions of objects and of unhomely survival following the critical event of 99. Property loss stands for the all-encompassing experience of uprooting. It stands for the time of war. Using a language of property to articulate such, such all-encompassing experience of loss as exemplified in Miodrag's statement property destroyed equal homelessness is neither a coincidence nor an accident of translation. Claimants sleep and dream of, of their property. They make a distinction between prop property and accumulated stuff. They say they left their sweat on the property by working their lands. They feel homeless because their property was destroyed. So how to analytically understand this focus on property and on property as object? Uh, as material stuff in narratives of, of loss. Anthropologists have long treated property less as a material object than as a relation of persons to things or as relations of people, people to each other mediated by things. We've usually emphasized the rights and obligations that such relationships involve. Uh, we have also looked at property as a bundle of abstract rights as a political symbol or as a historically uh, contingent Western native category that has strong effects in the world. Uh, that anthropological analysis has tended to avoid conflating property with thing speaks on the one hand to anthropologists' long mistrust of material culture. On the other, it speaks to the dem dematerialization of the thingness of property through the omnipresent language of rights, and also to the fact that new objects of property have arguably become less material. Yet, in decentering the agency of human subjects by exploring the agency, affordances, and effective qualities of objects and landscapes, recent scholarship has showed how objects blanketed under the label of property as things can both materially encapsulate and be assemblages of social relations. The idea is thus not necessarily to conflict property with thing, but to look at what things come to perform and materialize relations of property and why. Following this material turn, which I will not call ontological, I am interested in understanding how the concept of property came to be the label under which loss was arrayed. My informants talked about property in material terms because materials matter aesthetic, aesthetic, uh, aesthetically, effectively, sensorially, and mem no, I can't say that either, <laughs> mnemonically. And in that sense, talking about the materiality of things means talking about their social lives, their capacity to materially encapsulate and normalize loss. But as importantly, property was objectified uh, because in the present institutional legal context, the language of property acted as the epistemological framework of choice. In the process of legal translation, property worked as a shared language through which different epistemes or worldviews could be made commensurate. Mm. The description of material remains, which was pervasive in Clayman's narratives of loss, points to Clayman's continuous engagement with the past and to their persistent struggle with loss through melancholic objects. Memorializing material objects is a vehicle through which the traumatic experience becomes the main narrative device that stitches together an otherwise fragmented story. 
Property serves as a flexible signifier for relationships of loss, themselves characterized by ongoing bonds with the past through the appraisal of melancholic objects. This engagement generates sites for memory and history for the rewriting of the past as well as the reimagining of the future. It generates new forms of agency, such as claiming. So because the KPA process of offered a legal avenue to make claims, yeah, sorry, a legal avenue to make claims involves grievances focusing exclusively on property rights. Property became a discursive terrain on which, on which narratives of loss could be articulated. Articulating the lost home as property was thus a way of legally sanctioning grief through the voicing of a recognised injury, that of the war-related loss of property. I do not mean to construe a simple before-after argument and imply that people did not talk about property or value property documents before becoming K KPA claimants. Rather, KPA claimants appro appropriated a pervasive legalistic language of rights when talking about very personal experiences. Moreover, property can mean more than one thing and change signification over time, as the modalities and forms uh, and the values that we attributed to relations entailed under the idea of property, as well as the things it consists of, are reconfigured. Property in the form of documents became an, became an item of recognition, a repertoire of injury, a symbol of hope. However legalistic and narrow the KPA concept of property and ensuing mass claims remedy were, claimants saw in the KPA a means to claim reparation, as one, put it, as one claimant put it, as so as to have something in Kosovo, some kind of property. Because the KPA was only interested in property and due to the difficulties of accessing other uh, legal mechanisms to resolve war-related grievances, property became a repertoire, repertoire of discourse and action for the arraying of a broad range of grievances relating to the war. So the sole institutional focus on documents to determine property rights led to the centrality of documents for claimants when talking about and pursuing their claims. The documents lent rhythm, order, and legibility to their narratives in ways that gelled with their understanding of the KPA process and their role as claimants, that is, as ultimate providers and collectors of documents. Our interview, in our interviews, the narratives would work and would revolve around, around personal circumstances of loss, but quickly turn to explanations of the claim process in terms of documents received and exchanged. People kept documents safe, they lived surrounded by them, and their narratives of loss to me was mediated by them. So documents materialize relations of loss as property in terms of legalistic claim making. Claiming property through the KPA, which involved the translation of personal experience into a technical legal language of impinged on claiming subjectivities as much as it, as it transformed their relationship to their reputed property by way of documents. Um, so documents became markers of loss, at times mnemonic triggers, at times memorials in themselves, and possibly also written forms of closure. Pointing to the cover page of a KPCC decision, a claimant has stated, we're grateful to the KP for their help. Their help has registered the property in our name to protect it. Appro approximately two years after we submitted our claim to the KPA, the decisions for all the separate lots started coming in. These documents confirm that we are the rightful owners. The restitution of property rights by the KPA was first and foremost a process of legal knowledge production. It was primarily a bureaucratic system uh, that produced documents. Ultimately, property restitution had little to do with the return process, uh, reconciliation, the fate of claimed properties, uh, or the relations between uh, people. In the name of human rights and in the language of the technical legal, the property restitution process reconfirmed property rights in the abstract. The KPA is a good example of the paradox inherent to the bureaucratization of human rights, whereby relatively powerless and underfunded organizations are tasked with re resolving some of the most pressing contrary issues. 
such institutions seldom have the coercive powers to enforce compliance with their decisions. So this relative powerlessness leads to bureaucratic inflation, whereby the intrin intrinsic limitations of the program justify its perpetuation. But the question of success or failure uh, misses the point. Although many of my informants were disillusioned with the outcomes of the process, the production of decisions as paper did have effects. The paper, paper, paperization, sorry, paperization of property and property rights did not necessarily lead to their dematerialization, but reconfigured social relations and belonging. I interviewed DJ in her rental house in Buyanovac in early June 2013. As she told me her story, she showed me the documents she received from the KPA, confirming her family's ownership of the claimed property. The documents were both temporal and spatial markers of her family's ruptured relation to their former home. They encapsulated the intractability of a system of transi transitional governance as a form of um, permanent impermanence. She also proudly showed me her Kosovan ID card for which she had been able to apply, um, acting upon her KPA decision and register the claim property in her children's name. So she, she's one of the few claimants who actually uh, got to do something with her decision. Although returning in, uh, to Kosovo is not something she envisages as a possible outcome, outcome of claiming, um, Claiming has a generational effect on how her grandchildren imagine Kosovo today, uh, not in terms of a lost past, but um, in terms of a hopeful, imagined future. Um, and I'll end by uh, this quote. The kids love Kosovo. The youngest one, Marina, she says, Grandma, you and I will go in the summer. She goes, we will go and we will renovate the house. And there she loves because the house is really like ruins. Uh, and the grand granddaughter is imagining repainting the walls. If they hear a song about Kosovo, they all cry. The eldest grandson just went down there for Easter the Kos to Kosovska Kamenica, which is uh, on the border. We were all very worried. They could do anything to him. He spent the whole night at a bar and he was so happy. When he came back, he said, I spent a hundred euros. So be it. I don't feel bad, not one bit. That's how much fun I had. Now he comes and says, for future reference, Grandma, I'm going back there every year. And then she says, what can you do? <laughs> Thank you.